So first of all, we're going to ask Andrew Kingdon to come and talk to us about the design process and what was the original intention behind this project. I should say that the project was started back in 2008 um, when BIM was but a baby. And so we didn't set out originally to use soft landings or post-occupancy within this. And that's why we were doing an informal post-occupancy. So it's more of a review, if you like. Um, but Andy's kindly agreed to, to set out the background of what we were trying to achieve with our block um, and talk us through that, that process. Going to show us some good images as well. So I'll, I'll welcome Great. Andy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Liz. Um, I was uh, architect at Stride Um I was uh, project architect on uh, phase two uh, of the R block. Um, Liz has asked me t today to really speak about the project from the design and construction point of view. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the development of the project through the RIBA work stages, the use of BIM, um, key design features, and what we, the design team, uh, thought the, the project delivered. I'm just going to run through the presentation sort of in the order that uh, you would do with the RIBA work stages, but focus on some of those sustainable em elements of the building which are really key to the design uh, and give a summary at the end. So just a basic overview um, in regards to the project details. Stride for Glam were the architects, Hawley were the M&E consultants, Capital Simons were the structural and civil engineers, Turner and Townsend were the project managers. Um, it was a design and build contract. Wilmot Dixon were the uh, appointed contractor. And as Liz mentioned, um, we started design on this in 2008 and it was ready for the, the academic year in 2010. Um, also, as Liz touched on, it's very much an example of how we used to work rather than how we work now. Um, it was a BIM, BIM Level 1 project, um, so we had an architectural 3D Revit model, but we had other consultants feeding in 2D CAD information. Um, briefly just touch on the client, obviously the University of West of England. The actual building itself was for the Faculty of Environment and Technology, um, and the Department of Planning and Architecture and the Department of uh, Product Design were the main users of the building. Um, so we had architects, future architects and future product designers inhabiting this building. Um, obviously the site, um, as you can see, the, the French Air Campus uh, bird's eye view. You can see that the site uh, next to the existing building that we're in here. Um, photo taken from the, the entrance to Q Block. When we uh, started designing, the, the site was uh, a staff car park. Just touching on this existing building, um, completed in 2003, designed by White Design. Very innovative environmental uh, building for its, its time, and we wanted to continue that forward uh, with phase two. Um, in regard to the initial briefing information, uh, when we started the project, which is included in sort of the, the tender information, very basic um, in regard to an extension to this building for teaching and studio space for the faculty. We then developed the brief. Um, one of the key things we first realised that uh, it was not a duplicate of this building. The new building had to incorporate some very different uses, including a cafe, 150-seat uh, black box lecture theatre. And at that stage, we also set some targets in regard to energy and water, materials and recycling. And finally, the, the educational element of, of the project. We really wanted the building to be a tool for students to learn. Um, because it was architecture and, and design students using the building. In regard to sort of selected assessments and sort of mandatory regulations, um, we set the goal for part two, um, sorry, part L, um, as 20% improvement over the then 2006 requirement. We were aiming for a high rating in regard to an EPC. Um, Briam, we were aiming for the top grade we could achieve at the time, which was excellent under the, the 2006 assessment. And wrap, we were aiming for a 10% of materials used to be from a recycled content. Um, I'll, I'll touch on wrap a little bit later because it's, uh, it's something less known than the, than the others. Quickly going to whiz through site analysis. Um, I think the main thing that we realised looking at phase two was how much the context had changed uh, from when this building was built. Um, the, all of the new student accommodation had been built uh, and uh, it really created new connections through the site that weren't addressed when, when this building was first designed. Um, so, for example, one of our key elements was to link into that path shown in blue which, uh, and create a new entrance and a new arrival space uh, to unify phase one and phase two of the building. 
And these are just some initial orientation options. The site was very constrained for the amount of accommodation we had to fit on the site. So we did look at actually all of these options. We, we generally went for option two to set the building back to create a, a welcoming sunny plaza on the, on the south side of the building. Obviously, as architects, we, we know when we start designing uh, buildings, you, you start sketching uh, and producing lots of scribbles and various things like this to present to clients. Um, but even back then, we were using uh, a 3D model um, and we were producing models at various detail throughout the process and quite often sketching over these models um, to sort of give a softer feel to some of the information we were showing. Uh, the next few slides I've just set up as a, if I just jump onto the next one, you can see they, they should follow a pattern um, that hopefully you'll be able to see the development of the Revit model through the design process. So at the initial design stage, you can see we had a very, very simple um, Revit model there, an environmental section and some plans. Interestingly enough, that's sort of Kobe data drop one stage. Moving on to stage C, uh, you can clearly see we've got more information into our model. Uh, the environmental sections changed to uh, look at the, the different roof design we were looking at at that stage. And stage D, you can see that the design is very much more firmed up with a lot more detail in our, in our Revit model. And that's Kobe data drop two. And then when we got to the planning stage, we had a Revit model that um, you could clearly generate CGI views from uh, to, a, to a level of detail acceptable for planning. This is the landscape plan as part of the um, planning submission. Uh, this, wasn't, this was done by our landscape consultants, but wasn't in Revit. Uh, we were struggling at that time to get the level of quality out of our drawings. Um, just touching on the, the floor plans to the building, I, I think everyone here has either had an opportunity to look around or, or knows the building. Um, generally, the ground floor um, is very much a, a floor for the general uh, wider university open floor uh, with some of those centrally bookable spaces. The first floor is very much the academic heart of the building with the continuation of the, the street through the centre of the building and, and, and the studio spaces either side. Um, and some of the images on the, the right hand side are just taken from our uh, working Revit model. And then finally on the, the, the top floor, very much the quieter grown up floor with the staff offices and studios. This is just an example of our, one of our planning elevations which, as I said, at the time we were, we were using Revit, we were using BIM but we, we were photoshopping as well to try and get that level of quality out of the drawings. Uh, then some of the 3D views at planning. Now just moving on to some of the sustainability and energy efficient uh, items of the building. Very, very much from the outset, we, we had a, a sort of a four stage uh, strategy to look at the building, uh, to be lean, to look at passive design, then to be clean, looking at efficient plant and systems, and then to be green, to look at renewable technologies but also to look at alternative solutions. And we thought very much as this building was going to be for designers in the future to, to think outside the box, it, new technology was, was the way forward. It's just one of our initial, Hawley's initial um, environmental sections, looking at some of those passive uh, technologies and efficient systems. Another um, environmental section that really looked at daylighting, sunlighting, and how, you, how the orientation of the building could be changed. So, for example, uh, south-facing elevations, smaller amounts of glazing, north, north elevations with studios, uh, higher levels of glazing, for example. In regard to renewable technology, um, the building ended up with a, a biofuel boiler, um, which basically runs on recycled chip fat. Um, there was various um, discussions in, uh, and testing of different options. Um, the building has now actually got photovoltaics on it. Um, they were retrofitted as part of our uh, package of works. We put all the, the access and the man safe systems in for those. Rainwater recycling. Um, we've got rainwater to flush all the WCs um, and urinals, but grey water wasn't really seemed feasible with such a low demand. Um, this, this section, I think, is uh, for me, really tells the story of the building of how the natural ventilation system works um, and the sections in particular taken through the, the large uh, lecture theatre space, which we couldn't rely solely on natural ventilation, so we used a, a ground-coupled ventilation system. Uh, obviously, that those, that with the building being naturally ventilated, that led us to really investigating sort of bespoke designs for windows and other elements. Um, here you can see the south-facing 
uh, window design with low level louvers with a mechanical damper underneath um, for air intake and then manual uh, opening windows at high level. Uh, moving on to the north elevation, we, uh, in order to gain a, a level of cross ventilation, we had stacked chimneys um, and the image at the bottom there you can see where the, the intakes are within the studio spaces and there's a, a damper behind that that opens and closes with the, the BMS system. And then as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, you've got the ground coupled ventilation system for the lecture theatre. Uh, jumping on to materials um, in particular, um, I mentioned earlier on about the RAP assessment. Um, basically, the university set a target that 10% of all the materials used in the building would be from re recycled material content. Um, obviously, when designing buildings, you look at materials from a whole range of aspects, maintenance, degree guide rating, particularly as, as we were going for BRIAM. But the RAP did set us down a course of looking at um, renewable materials, recycled materials, and also reclaimed materials. So as part of the design process, we were very much producing these sort of sheets that actually looked at all of those options to see what, what we were actually scoring well on in terms of RAP and what we were scoring well on in terms of BRIAM, et cetera, and weighing those options up. So in regard to recycled materials, one of the, the key winners for us was the, the rain screen cladding, uh, which is basically made from all the waste, slate, and uh, brick dust from uh, Ibstock's factories, from the brick... Uh, making process which had a really high recycled content. Some other quick wins were the uh, recycled concrete blocks which had a high recycled content and we use uh, cellulose insulation in the walls which had a, again a very high recycled content. Um, we used the uh, Modstale straw bale prefabricated panel system for the lecture theatre. I had lots of questions about why we had Modstale for the external walls and the internal walls. Um, generally because I think if you see on the next slide, because we had a lecture theatre that was a quiet space next to a very noisy uh, cafe, uh, we used it internally for the acoustic properties as well. And with that sort of uh, system, it is really good for engaging clients and users of the building. They can actually go to the flying factory, which is set up within a 10 mile radius of the, the site and be involved in actually making the building. Um, and then in regard to reuse, we, uh, one of the examples was the um, reclaimed timber. We clad the uh, cafe pod in, which came from an a, a ex-cheese factory in Somerset, which was quite funny. When we, we always took the, when we took the timber to the design team meeting, the first thing everyone did was pick it up and smell it to see whether it's uh, quite funny. Uh, moving on to stage E to H, um, the, we went out to tender at stage E plus, obviously this is the old RIBA work stages. Um, and this is very much the level of detail we had in the Revit model. As you can see, it's uh, quite detailed. Um, and that was Kobe drop, uh, data drop level three. In regards to production information, um, although we did have the Revit model at that stage, it was generally 2D information, DWGs and PDFs that we were, were issuing. Um, but during construction, there were other consultants um, that were using 3D packages, such as the steel fabricators using the Tetla model, and some of our, I think it's the cladding subcontractors using SketchUp, so we were issuing 3D information for them, uh, and they were adapting that. Obviously, during the process, we, we uh, did a number of site visits, uh, presentations with various stakeholders to both the site and also the, the flying factory. So moving on to measurement, um, we achieved our, our BRIAM rating uh, of excellent, uh, generally a good score across the board in all of the scat categories. Um, as I alluded to earlier on, some of the, the credits were affected by our RAP target. So for example, some of those um, building elements that had a very high recycled content didn't score so well on the, the green guide rating uh, with the range from cladding, for example, having a C rating, a certificate. Uh, EPC rating, we got a, a good score of 35. RAP, um, we, we managed to double our um, score, uh, our target uh, of 10%. Uh, so we got a good recycled content within the building. In regard to our Partel um, calculations, this is uh, Hawley's thermal model uh, in the images on the screen. Um, we actually, in, in regard to the building emission rate, we uh, achieved a 31% improvement above the 2006 requirements. And then just, just finally moving on to some of the 
images of the completed building. Um, what we feel that the building did deliver was a, a sort of a clear front entrance to the building which embraced the new context. Um, some social breakout spaces uh, with the creation of the new plaza which we felt wasn't really incorporated in some of the existing spaces at UWE. Um, a real social learning space um, within the cafe space for, for students to meet, have a coffee, meet with lecturers. Um, the continuation of this sort of street space we have here um, for students to sort of display their work and very much um, publicise the work they undertake in the building. Just another image of that central space. And then some of those elements to inform. Um, so the idea of exposing structure, exposing services so that the students can understand how the building works. That's a picture of the, the rear elevation. You can see the size of the biofuel uh, flue there. So I think in, in summary, I, I think what, what the talks tried to highlight is that although this was a number of years ago, it is an example of how we used to work. It was taken to BIM level one. Um, we, we think it was an inventive environmental strategy. Um, the building itself, we think, uh, helped to educate future designers. Um, and a, a building that embraces sort of new ways to study and work, as some of those photographs had shown. Um, I'll now pass you on to really answer the question about what happened next.